Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and happy 2023. We are back for another great series of interviews from across Alberta and around Canada. And today I couldn't be honored, couldn't have been honored to have our guest onto the show. He is the former MLA uh, for Stony Plain from 1971 to 1986, and also the former mayor of the village of Wabaman from 2000 to 2008. Bill Purdy. Mr. Purdy, Bill, welcome to the show. My pleasure being with you. So, Bill, I, I've asked every single person who's ever come on the show the same question, so you're no exception. So my question to you is this. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? I guess it goes back to my high school days. It goes back to my parents and uh, just the realm of people that I got to know and, and so on. Um, in high school, I was with the Students' Union, uh, president of that, and that was 1957 and 58. So I'm dating myself a bit. But uh, my dad was um, uh, an elected official with the uh, county of Lac-Saint-Anne or the MD of Lac-Saint-Anne back in the 50s. So that kind of got into my blood and, and I followed him. And then uh, when I um, uh, uh, moved to uh, Wabnam, where I, we still reside, I um, got very involved with the community association. And uh, uh, when I, my first day of work was September the 15th, 1961. And that evening, I was out there helping the community association. We were building a new uh, Jubilee Hall, and I was hauling cedar blocks up the side of the wall, and and it didn't stop from there. And uh, from two years, three years later, I was president of the association, of the community association, and uh, it went from there. And then uh, I got a bit involved in in the political realm of things. My dad was a kind of a diehard liberal. And uh, I um, persuaded myself that that wasn't my route to go. So I started looking at the uh, Conservatives. And um, that was in 1967 when, when Peter Lougheed came on the scene. And um, I got involved with the Stony Plain Constituency Association, which was very small. And, and uh, it was organized, but it still had a lot of work to be done. And I got very, very involved with it. And then um, discussion with a number of people in the constituency. Uh, we knew that there was, um, in 67, there was an election. Uh, and the um, conservative candidate from there was um, uh, Frank Flanagan, who was related to the Horner family. He had married uh, Ruth, who was Doc Horner, Hugh Horner's uh, sister. And uh, so I got involved in that 67 campaign, door knocking and so on. And then about two years later, I got in, uh, involved and became the president of the Stony Plain Conservative Association. And we built it from there. And then uh, I got to know Peter Lougheed very well. And uh, we, you know, we had uh, various regional meetings and uh, and meetings where the uh, president was very involved trying to get organized in, in all 75 constituencies in Alberta. And uh, so I did some organization in the north part of the in the north part of the uh, cons uh, province. And then uh, I got a call where we we were seriously really looking for a candidate to run in the uh, we suspected it would be 1971 election. And uh, it uh, went around about a dozen people that uh, were, you know, conservative leaners and and uh, and supporters and so on, but nobody wanted to really take the task on. Why was and, that? Why was that? Because seventy one was the year that uh, Lougheed was more popular than the previous election. Why? Why weren't people? beaten down the doors was the so creds in stony plain so popular or was the local mla at the time so popular yes he was and he was toted to be the next minister of agriculture a very upstanding family uh the jesperson family i had a lot of respect for them and i still do i still relate with them a, a lot and um 
So uh, that was the that was the key to it. And uh, we had numerous meetings. And then um, one evening, Peter called me and, and, and I said, well, we got a, a meeting going on later in the evening and we'll see what which way we can go. And um, so we talked around the table, around the coffee table for probably an hour and various people were mentioned again and they turned it down and so on. And that was about the extent of it there. And I, you know, I, I hated to be the bearer of bad news for Peter the next morning. And we were cleaning up the wife and myself and um, our young one-year-old daughter was kind of following us around and, and so on. But um, Diane was in a little bit of a moody way. And um, so I said, what's wrong? And she said, well, they never mentioned your name. They never talked about you. I said, do you think I should really go for it? And she said, sure. So, so it, it was your wife that got you the, the sort of pushed you over the edge to say, okay, it's you. Why not you? Right. Well, that's correct. There's going to be some harmony in, in you know, in the whole marriage situation <laughs> and so on. And, uh, I was, you know, we were just starting out. We just got married. Well, we were married in 63, but, um, you know, we were doing various things and um, we were busy. But anyway, uh, that was the deciding factor because I thought about it occasionally, but I didn't really make it, you know, put the announcement out there. Anyway, on the the next morning, I phoned Peter and said, well, you got a candidate. And he says, who's that? And I said, me. He said, well, that's what I thought we should be doing. So that really bolstered my uh, my uh, profile and so on, and um, we went ahead with a nomination meeting the early part of May in '71, and we anticipated an election would would be called sometime during the summer, and uh, we ended up with about 200 people in in the uh, community center in Stony Plain. Oh, wow. A lot of people came out to the meeting, and uh, Peter Lougheed was there, and uh, Hugh Horner. Uh, some of the other ones that have been nominated and some of the ones that were sitting in the legislature as an MLA, like Lou Heinemann and, and other ones came out to that. Anyway, um, the um, the 200 turned out to be about 500 supporters of, of workers, I should say. There was lots of supporters out there, but it was key to build an organization with uh, poll workers, door knockers and the whole thing. And we did that and we did it very professionally and so on. And um, so was it a it, contested nomination? Did you run unopposed or did you run against somebody for that nomination in 71? No, I was unopposed. Okay. So, uh, and, and um, I have a quick question because you have had the pleasure to work alongside Peter Lougheed and Peter Lougheed in this province is somewhat of a political God. People look at him as the standard bearer of a good politician. Well, you, you talk about the time that you sat around the coffee table and you talked about politics with him, about who would run in that riding. What was he like? Like from your perspective, we, we hear the stories, the news reports and all that, but you, you got to work with the man. You got to know him as a friend. What was he actually like? Was it, is it what we see in the news reports? He was really down to earth. And he took the political game to heart and he didn't make any commitments until he had support within the caucus and so on to do those commitments. You know, right today, we've got a leader there that's running out and making announcements, and I don't think the caucus knows what's going on half the time. But Peter kept us in in touch all the time. And um, to keep me more involved and so on, um, would he, he would he be open me? to suggestions? Because oh, we yeah. often we, we often hear about the top down governments that we have now, where the premier dictates or the prime minister dictates. Would Peter Lahey say, "Okay, what does everyone want here?" Because we want to do this as a unified caucus. No, he was uh, very very fair, and um, he, one of his favorite sayings is that I win some, I lose some, and he lost some some debates in caucus that you know he come forth with but he he always he never made uh, many decisions without the caucus being there and involved and i was appointed in uh, after the election in 70 in, in august of the 30th as uh, caucus secretary 
so I had a lot more to do with with him and and so on. And uh, you know, we as I say, we we got along quite well, and I wouldn't mind resurrecting him and having him back. I think there's a lot of people who would agree with you there, Will, uh, Bill. Um, I want to talk about that election, that very first election that you ran in in 1971. On election day, and I just had to pull it up here, on August 30th, 1971, you are proclaimed the new MLA for the riding of the Electoral District of Stony Plain. Is there a weight that you put on your shoulders at that moment? Because now the decisions that you're going to be making, the decisions that you're going to be voting on are going to dictate the day-to-day lives of not only your family members, your friends, but your neighbors and everyone in Alberta. That's uh, correct, you know, because your lifestyle changes a lot. You still, I was still Bill Purdy in the constituency and, and the realm of people that I knew, but it was a different responsibility and a lot more things that were going on. Uh, one of the concerns I had, which I looked after prior to the election, I was a power engineer with, uh, Trans, uh, with Calgary Power of the day, which is now Trans Alta Utilities, and uh, after I'd got the nomination, I wrote uh, the uh, president a letter saying that I'd been nominated for the conservatives and the company was very conservative leaning. And I said, you know, when, when I'm elected, I would still like to be, be, say as an employee of this great company. So he sent me a letter back, said, yep, if you get elected, when you get elected, you will have a job with the company. We'll have to realign things for you, but we'll, we'll make sure that you're looked after it. So you were doing two jobs at the same time as an MLA. You were That's doing right. your yeah. right. That you, so, you know, okay. In, in, in 1971, the workload was not as great as it is today for an MLA because there's a lot more going on. We had just over a million people in the province. Now we got over 4 million. So there's a lot more things going on and so on. The constituencies have grown by a lot and the number of, uh, constituencies is only grown by 12 in the last 50 years you know so the uh, the numbers of of uh, el- eligible voters in a constituency probably went up 50 to 75 percent and uh you know so that was um that was uh, a big contributing factor to that but um i was uh, elected by a 650 vote majority which was pretty overwhelming in in those days uh, but, you know, we, we did our due diligence. We went door to door. We just really, uh, when, when I went to um, any door that, especially in the rural area of the constituency, and there was, there was very heavy farm population, I knew the people that I was going to visit because I had the county or the uh, MD map with me and, and uh, so on. So, you know, that made the job a lot easier when you knew who you were going to be talking to and so on. And then we had a base of, um, of people. We didn't like, like Spruce Grove today is around 35,000 people. Spruce Grove in 1971 was maybe 1500 or 2000, the same as the town of Stony Plain. And, uh, you know, everything's grown from there. Were people but, politically uh, engaged in 71? Like we, we look at the, uh, the engagement, with volunteerism and political campaigns in today's age. And you don't get the dedication that I saw when I saw my first campaign in 1990. In 1971, did people come out and volunteer and go door knocking with you? Oh, definitely. Yeah, there was a, there was just a real uh, number of people in the business community, in the farm community. Um, I represented uh, three uh, First Nations and uh, they even come out and volunteer to go door knocking on my behalf in the constituency. Oh, wow. in, in the, in, in, as an example, Paul Bandery, Alexis, or Enoch. And you know, it, it all fell together. You know, it, it was a bit of a jigsaw puzzle to start, but we, it, it came together so fast. You you have had the pleasure to walk on the uh, Alberta legislative floor, the legislative floor as an elected official. That very first day when you walked in as the MLA elect for Stony Plain, what was that feeling like for you? It was overwhelming. 
Um, Did it ever change through your time in office? Yeah, it, uh, you know, I I guess if you go in there, I, I went I, I went in there at the age thirty one, and you know, I had a lot to do with industry and and the electrical industry and so on and and other things and community based stuff, but this was a lot bigger field, and uh, there was a lot more responsibility. You don't want to embarrass yourself there because at that time, the media or there was no uh, uh, newspapers or TV in, in the uh, chambers. We bought that in, in in the 70s. So, you know, you progressed with it and, and you learned from it and you became a, a better person. And the, uh, the friendship was there, the support, because, you know, we had uh, the number of people that were elected in various occupations was kind of overwhelming. You know, you look at it today and I think there's only one lawyer on the government side we had seven or eight yeah. we had farm communities people that were deep deeply involved in the farming industry school teachers you know we had a such a profile of the demographics out there that it was really 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 beneficial to us as a party you were relatively a new government as well because this is what in 1971 it was the very first time a government had changed hands in some time from the social credits to the progressive conservatives how big was that learning curve because no one in the progressive conservative association uh, the party had been serving in government before so you had to sort of learn as you went along for you being a sort of an upper bencher as peter law he used to call them how was it to see the government sort of learn and grow as it went along well we spent probably a good week before the legislature went in before the throne speech was pre presented by the uh, speaker and the 10 MLAs that were in the House uh, prior to the 71 election on the conservative side were really, really helpful. And we went through every strategy, everything that you could think of. And um, it that was really beneficial to everyone that was on the, the other 39 of us that were sitting there. It was a deep learning curve, but it was really beneficial the way that Peter and, and the party and the uh, the former or the MLAs that were there just put everything together. You 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 served for four terms. So from 71 to 86, you served, uh, you ran in elections in 71, 75, 79, 82, and you retired in 86. During your four terms in office, what were the highlights? What were the, some of the highlights that you look back on? You go, you know what? This is why I did it. This bill, this policy is why I did it. This is why I got into politics to help people better off. What was that policy for you? Or were there numerous policies? There was numerous things that took place. Um, I was an advocate, very strong advocate of a better highway system throughout the province, but more, you know, looking at our constituency because it was starting to grow. Uh, the Stony Plain constituency was uh, the eastern boundary was 170th Street in Edmonton. So there was a, uh, about 10, 10 blocks that come out into of the city of Edmonton that come out into the Stony Plain constituency. Okay. And uh, well, we represented that, but we had two lane highways out of Edmonton. When I left politics in 86, we had uh, one, two, three, uh, two lane or four lane highways coming out of Edmonton to the uh, west. We had no overpasses. Uh, there was a lot of uh, accidents and so on because of just the conditions of the highways, the overwhelming uh uh, traffic that was especially in the summertime coming out going to jasper coming out to lake wabnam alberta beach and all these areas the highways were really congested it you know it was something that we really had to look at and um, we the government across the province did a fantastic job of doing the highway net system that should have been done 10 years ago and um Right now, sure, we're looking at problems of, of funding the 
maintenance of these highways. But if you're going to keep traffic flowing and, and everything, you've got to have the dollars that are do that. And then uh, one of the first things that uh, Peter asked me to do was to chair the uh, Provincial Election Act. And um, I'd had some comments on it prior to uh, when I was sitting in meetings and so on of the Election Act itself and so on. So we had an all party committee that um, uh, was uh, put together in 1972 and we reported in the fall of 74, 73. And this, the uh, new act was going to be in place for the next provincial election, which was anticipated to be in 1975. So what were some of the changes in there? Well, one of the big changes was that the Socrates had a 38 day campaign. And uh, we narrowed that down by 10 days. We looked at financial situations. There was no tracking of financial situations. So we come up with the financial administration act for elect for the, uh, for the elections. Um, there was um, other uh, areas that we looked at in the, uh, the whole realm of the operation and so on. So it, it, uh, it took a while, but it came out and uh, there was full support in the assembly of it. The Socrates were the opposition. They had 26 members and, and uh, they supported it. And so did uh, Grant Notley, who was the lone NDP. And then from there, I, I got involved in a number of, of things. I was um, uh, very, very supportive of the uh, RCMP and, and their role and so on. And even back in that time, we did have discussions about provincial police, but the discussions were discussion only. It never really got out there in the public or anything like that. It was within the confines of the, of the caucus. and. Uh, <laughs> A, you know, we, we looked at lots of variables and um, the uh, another one that I was involved in was a hospital for the uh, constituency. We didn't have one. We had to rely on the misericordia. And uh, we eventually, uh, it took about 10 years to get that built, but we eventually got a new hospital in the town of Stony Plain, which served the whole area. And, and then the other thing was um, uh, municipalities and funding for them and, and uh, so on. Um, in the first term, the thing that we did was we looked at the revenues and, and, uh, and the balanced budgets and all, all that. And uh, one of the decisions we made in the 70s, I think it was 75, that um, we, any senior citizen that was paying municipal tax would no longer be paying an education tax. Wow. And that's about a third of your tax bill. And uh, that went along until Ralph Klein come along. And he, well, they, there was not mismanagement, but just poor judgment in how to really do financial businesses in that kind of a setting. So they put the tax back on and, and it hit a lot of people that, that, you know, our argument was that, you know, these were the founders of this province, these the farmers and, and the other ones that worked in whatever it was. And they've already paid their tax and their bill to put their children through school. And now they're going to have to put their grandchildren through school. So, uh, but they went ahead with it, the Klein government, and um, there was not much, to, you know, I was sitting in the back watching it then. Yeah. Um some might say, uh, political observers will say that the 1970s to 1980s was the was was were the two decades that Alberta became Al the Alberta that we know today. Yes, it's changed a little bit, but it grew substantially. We had we saw natural resource uh, development left, right, and center. The Alberta advantage was what uh, Alberta is known for. Came through those two decades. You were on the front line. You served under Peter Lawhey. You served under uh, ministers of finance, ministers of natural resources, energy. How did you guys do it? Because there was challenging times where you had a federal government in Ottawa who 
was a liberal, Pierre Trudeau, who didn't really look kindly to the West. And people are looking at the same similarities here going, OK, we have a liberal government. We have a conservative uh, provincial government. How did you guys navigate through that? Was it Peter Lougheed's, like dedication to the province that got you through the turbulent times and the turbulent relationships? Or was there something else that most people are missing uh, in the the Peter Lougheed Trudeau relationship? We had a very strong team that was put together when we went to Ottawa in 1982 on the rightful ownership of the natural resources. In 1932, those were granted to us, but there was never any big firm decision. And uh, the, you know, the wrath come back after us, you know, because we, the the uh, revenues and the royalties that were being paid by the oil companies was next to nothing. And we raised those substantially. And this this was in the, in the uh, 70s. And, you know, we had a bigger flow of cash and everything coming in, but we still didn't have the significant uh, support of the federal government or anything until Peter and uh, another strong component was that there were so many of them, but Jim Horseman, who was the uh, uh, federal and intergovernmental affairs uh, leader in there, Lou Hyman was also in that position for some terms. And... Um, they were the integral part of that and the and the full caucus was right behind what well i should say the full legislature was right behind there wasn't that many of them because there was only i think three socrates and an ndp there for a couple of terms but anyway you know it was a cohesive uh, thing there and alberta had a very very strong voice and we did it in a professional manner that we didn't alienate any of the other provinces or anything. You know, we, we worked with Quebec on other areas of it. Uh, Quebec uh, Hydro was in financial bad stability. They borrowed money through our Heritage Savings Trust Fund to boost up what they were doing in some of the development and so on in, in, the, uh, in the northern part of uh, Quebec. So I, I want to I follow up on something you just said there. And you, you mentioned the word teams. And I find it fascinating that in the 70s and 80s, Peter Lougheed had a fantastic team around him. His caucus was united. There wasn't that many people, you would say, who had egos who wanted the bigger and better job or the corner office in the legislature. People were willing to work as a team. We don't see that that often. What made Peter Lougheed such a great leader in the legislature and as a caucus leader to keep his caucus united? He had respect from every one of us. We had one person in the 70s, I think it was the 79 election, where there was a, um, a debate that went to the polls, you might say, over the, the importance of Alberta and so on and the referendums and stuff that was happening, we had one member from Calgary that opposed that. And he was unilaterally told by a caucus, along with the premier, that he's no longer welcome. And that, it, that just reinforced of what the strength was in that caucus and the strength of the leadership that the premier had. You you serve for four terms, and then in 1986, you've decided that you would be leaving politics, elected politics on the provincial level. You having new premier in 1985, Don Getty becomes the new premier because Peter Lougheed resigns. You leave in 1986. Was the transition from premier to premier the decision, or was there other decisions outside of that that made you decide finally, okay, four terms is enough, it's time to go back into the private sector? Well, there was a couple of factors there. Um, I I appreciated uh, Don Getty's uh, work. His uh, did you endorse him during the eighty five uh, leadership election? Well, he I I sat with him in the uh, in the uh, legislature in eighty six when he was the premier. Okay. And uh, Peter stepped down in 85 
and the leadership thing was held in the late part of 85. And then Don became premier and uh, he put together his team and, and so on. And, and um, I had made a decision then that uh, I would, uh, during the, the election campaign for the leader of the party, uh, three individuals ran for it, uh, Julian Kozak from Edmonton, Ron Gitter from Calgary, and Don Getty from Edmonton. And uh, I initially supported Ron Gitter. And um, Do you mind me he, asking why? Do you mind me asking why? Because I, I, I've heard the name a few times because I had the pleasure of sitting down with David Carter uh, in November, and he, he said the exact same thing because I, I just want to know, what was it about Gitter that uh, drew you to him? Was it just your friendship with him or was there other outstanding circumstances that you wanted to endorse him? I think that, you know, because of his, the integrity that he had and, and so on in Calgary and, and, and it proliferated across the province, that Ron was a very strong individual and um, was respected by a lot of people. And I, you know, we encouraged a number of us, encouraged him to run for the leadership. And um, he unfortunately didn't go to the second ballot, uh, Julian did. So I flipped over to Julian and then uh, Don won it in the end and, and we all come together. Um, about the same time as that's going on. I'm 46 years old. I've been with the company for a number of well, since 1961. So I've got, you know, a number of years in and they offered me a senior position in Calgary. And I looked at it and um, made the decision then, yeah, okay, I, I don't want to stay in politics all my life. Um, I should be where there is a bit more resources in the dollar coming in which, you know, the company was, was uh, there to support me. And uh, I uh, took so that did position. You, did you announce publicly or did you tell uh, Premier Getty first that you were not going to be uh, standing for re-election? I let him know and I let the caucus know. And I've got a stack of, of, uh, of thank you notes, probably four inches thick from the night I made my uh, my uh, going away speech in the assembly. Uh, one of the other areas in the assembly that I that I really appreciated doing was in 1974. We looked at the workload that the speaker and the deputy speaker had, and uh, we looked at the parliamentary system in in North America and and, and the British thing, and. There was all there was uh, a move to uh, put in place a deputy chair of committees, and uh, at that time the premier made those those appointments. So Peter came to me and asked me, "Would you fill that position?" So I did that for uh, fifteen years. Oh, wow! Oh no, just under fifteen. About about twelve years, I guess. The, the thing was there since nineteen seventy one, and that uh, position still is available is you know it's still in in the legislative assembly now but i was the uh first uh, person to uh, enjoy that particular role and you also have the role of speaker of the house on many occasions and um in uh, in committee of, of supply or committee of the whole there was always you know between uh the deputy speaker frank appleby and myself we we were every every day we were busy doing one thing or another you, you talked about how in 1971 you had the two jobs you were working and you had the mla job as well um by the time you left in 86 was the mla's job a full-time job or was it still that you could do both jobs at once because you talk about your MLA job, you talk about the deputy committee, uh, the, the committee chairmanship, and then I, I'm sitting here going, okay, how do you have enough time to even do another job with family life on top of that? Well, it was it was fairly trying because uh, the position that I had with the company was a uh, uh, special uh, special projects engineer, and it had to, a lot to do with the environment because we had three power plants that were running 
and uh, they were under scrutiny by some people. Uh, you know, one uh, one power plant used Lake Wabnum for their cooling pond, and it uh, inhibited and and <laughs> started a real problem with weed growth and other things like that. So I was I was on top of that. So when the and I had about 30, 35 people working for me uh, at the company's side. But in the wintertime, it was fairly quiet. But in the summertime, I put in a lot of 18-hour days. Wow. I'd, uh, I had a place in Edmonton where I stayed. But uh, the other thing to give me a little bit of a break was the, the uh, deputy chair's position because we would lay out our, our workload. So maybe every third night or something, I would get the evening off and the other two would be there, you know, and then vice versa. So, uh, but it, it worked out. I enjoyed it. I put a lot of hours in. The wife was very supportive. Uh, our second child was born in 76. And, um, well, I didn't get to see my new daughter for about 24 hours. Oh, wow. We had other problems that were going on. The legislature wasn't sitting. And then also at that time, there wasn't as many legislative committees and so on as there is today. You know, you, it's overwhelming the number of, of secretaries, press secretaries and, and secretaries to whom in the realm that's there right now as compared to when, when I was there. Um, and, and the business of the, of the government got done. So I'm going to ask, I asked you about the good times. So I'm going to ask you about the bad times. What's the one thing that you could, you wish you could go back and do over again if you had the chance? Well, that's a difficult question because we were in pretty lucrative times. And um, I really couldn't nail down really one large issue that if you know there was some smaller issues that affected some of the municipalities uh like policing was one of them and, and i was an advocate there because the they had uh the government come in and changed in 72 and and i voted against the changes because there was a lot of police forces in the province that were trained and so on but the RCMP was the main police force, and uh, they they convinced the government that they should, you know, continue that role, which they did. But then there was also the role of the of the municipal police in the smaller towns that were really segregated, and um, some of them were relegated to uh, peace. Uh, uh, peace officers and, and bylaw officers, and uh, they were stripped of sidearms and so on. So I took a cudgel up to um, talk about that. And um, I made a, a present uh, speech in the legislature on the Police Act, which I voted against because of what they had done. And um, Peter talked to me about it, and he said, you know, pretty strong persuasions and so on. And I said, well, you know, this is what my constituency is telling me. And he said, good point. But he said, back off a little bit. So I did. And the, one, of the th one of the factors was that the uh, minister that was spearheading this, Helen Hundley, she was away in Halifax. And... The, they had picked up my news story on this on the system uh -oh. and the, in the Halifax Tribune or the Herald come out headlines on the front page move to Alberta please don't wear guns and that was one of the things that I said in my presentation you know if you're going to have a, a, P, a policeman out there that's trained and everything he's dealing with the same people that the RCMP or the city police are dealing with they should be armed. And and eventually, after I left in 86, they did arm them. And then um, in uh, when Klein went in, they were stripped of arms again. And uh, so I've just, I haven't been involved in that thing for, you know, a number of years. I just stayed away from it. But 
1986, you retire from elected politics, but the call for elected politics is always strong with people who've uh, been elected at least once. In 2000, you decide, or are, there's persuasion? No, in 19, the, well, was that 1986? 1986. Well, 1986. Yeah, 1986, yeah. you retire. So you leave elected politics, provincial politics in 1986. But in 2000, you decide you're going to put your name forward for the village of Wobberman? I, I decided because of the uh, representation that was made back to me by the village of Wobberman residents to run in 86. Oh, you okay. For some reason, I thought it was 2000. Oh, yeah, yeah I, I become mayor in 2000. But uh, from 86 to 2000, the person that was the deputy mayor, he was reelected, and and I just, you know, gentlemen's agreement and stuff. He continued on as mayor for four years, and then he was dropping out. So I, I, uh, it's, and the mayor at that time was appointed by the council. It wasn't appointed by the citizens. Yeah. So uh, that you know that was that was one of the factors there, but then I I also uh, in '86 got elected to the board of the Alberta Urban Municipalities, and I was uh, vice president for a number of years representing villages, and then I became president of the Urban Municipalities, the first village to be represented by a president in 36 years. Wow! And uh, I I. I was involved in a lot of changes and so on with the AUMA, uh, new office buildings and and, and just a, a different profile throughout the province. And we became a very, very strong organization. We provided insurance. We still provide insurance for all the municipalities, uh, training for elected officials. Just, you name it, it was done. So Did your time in... Did your time in provincial politics prepare you for municipal politics? Because yeah. they're two separate beasts, right? Provincial politics, it's you have an opposition where municipal politics, it's everyone's on the same team and we're trying to work towards the betterment of our village, our town, or our city. For you, did did your time in elected office in provincial politics prepare you for the role in uh, the village? Yeah, and it was a it was very beneficial because it also gave me as a uh, vice president of the AUMA a lot of credibility that I could phone a minister and get a meeting with them and so on, and we opened that door wide open throughout government. You know, even when uh, Ralph was there and and Don Getty was. They're partially during part of that. Uh, the, that really helped. Um, the other thing that I got involved in very strongly uh, in the in the in, in years was the fire services. We had a fire department in uh, the in the uh, hamlet of Wabnam that was established in 1964, and I joined that well with the community association and other things but i i'm still there as an honorary operating chief wow. and we've got 100 we've now got to, for the area of parkland county we've got 120 uh, uh paid on call firefighters and we've got two new halls that are um, manned uh you... with with time employees and wow. so and that that went off into the into the uh, system in the fire system that I became in 2000 and I, I joined the fire chief's board, which was a small organization in uh, 1984 as a director at large. And then after I left politics, my role, my role still continued with the fire chiefs. And in 2006, they, uh, president and uh, and uh, executive committee asked me to take over the role as executive director. So I did a lot of work with there and I opened a lot of government doors and so on in the uh, 10 years that I spent as executive director. So I guess I have to uh, wrap up on this question, Bill, because I, I, I am cautious of time here. And that is right. you have had a, a a substantial career in politics, whether it be provincial, whether it be municipal, you look back on your career 
do you miss it? Do you miss time in elected politics or have you gotten past the glitz and glam that was politics and now you're happy to be looking on the outside and looking from the outside in now? No, I'm, I'm very satisfied uh, looking back over the, uh, you know, 60 years, just about or 52 years in the uh, provincial end of it, that um, I don't miss it. I sit there and fret every once in a while when things aren't going as I think they should. But that's the realm of politics these days that, uh, you know, it, it grew, uh, grew on a lot of people, but a lot of them just walked away from it too you know in in right now uh we formed in 206 a um, former mla's um association and i was president of that from i think about six years but um uh, i haven't been very I haven't been very involved with them over the last number of years. I just, you know, I've had other things I wanted to do and I uh, still keep active in the community and, and uh, with fire services and so on. Well, Bill, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor of my lifetime to sit down with you and talk about your career in politics because I find it fascinating when I can pick the brains of the people who have been elected before us and learn from them what how how we are the way we are today. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. I got one little closing story if we got a minute. You hey, you take as much time as you want. <laughs> Okay, I, I but going back to the election campaigns in 1971, um, we had uh, I had a um, a very well known farmer businessman in Spruce Grove area that was running my campaign, campaign manager, and um, in Spruce Grove I would go to the door and and uh, hand out my business card and my calling card and so on and give it to them and uh, they'd say, well, you know, we're just new in town and da, 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 you know, things like that. And I said, well, look at um, Alan Shenfield is my campaign manager. And the guy would cut me off and say, you know, Alan? I said, yeah, very well. He said, so, so do I, he says, I'm voting for you. And it went, it went like that. But then the closing story was in the, during the day I'd visit the farm community, as I said earlier, and I knew which place I was going to all the time. So I stopped south of Spruce Grove at this farmhouse about 1, 11.30 in the morning. And an older lady comes out and um, I introduced myself. And she was, you know, uh, a longtime resident, but still broken German English. So um, she said, no, we all wrote it voting for Ralph. We are voting for Ralph. And I said, no, I said, I really appreciate your honesty and things like that. And um it's, you know, been a pleasure meeting you. And I said, oh, by the way, I said, um, <coughs> what relation were you to Henry uh, Barron that moved from uh, the Stony Plain area to Barhead? And she says, first cousins. I said, I married their daughter. Come in for lunch. <laughs> you do not see politics like that at all anymore. People oh. don't. I'm going to ask this question because you have seen politics and you've seen elections come and go. Has our elections changed? People don't go door knocking anymore. People don't do this interaction of between people anymore, do they? Not like, I much. don't see it. No, no, not as much. Uh, you know, like in the 1970 campaign, that we had the, an organization here that was the, the envy of a lot of constituencies across Alberta. And when the election was called, Peter phoned me and said, I'm making the announcement tomorrow morning. And this is about 10 o'clock in the morning. He said, pull your troops together because the announcement, the announcement is going to be made in the uh, centennial room in the town of Spruce Grove. Wow. wow. And we, did, we, we packed the place. Good for you. That is awesome. Yeah. Bill, I and want to thank... Oh, thank you so much for doing this. I, I Again, I'm just cautious of time here because I know I said 45 minutes, but thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with me today. 
Well, I, I really appreciate that. And um, you know, I'm looking forward to, to hearing the airing of it. If you can send me the information of when this is going to be on and so on. So my family and so on can watch it. <coughs> and, but, uh, you know, it's been a last hour and so has been really good. I really appreciate that. I, I certainly agree. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down your social media and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our democracy. It helps our society. And it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the cross border interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking. Thank you.